Hello, I'm George Maynham, the Managing Editor of IoT Now. Thanks very much for joining us for today's webinar, the title of which is Build versus Buy, Making the Right Decision for Your IoT Application. During the session, we'll be looking at the background of the Build versus Buy decision, the key considerations, and the best practices for successful deployment. I'm delighted to be joined by Robin Duke Woolley, the, uh, Duke Woolley, the um, Chief Executive of Beecham Research, um, as well as Julie Coston, the Vice President of Strategic Development for EMEA, and Peter Van den Houten, the Director of Pre-Sales Engineering, both from CORE. I'll hand over to Robin shortly to set the scene, but first we have a poll question um, which we'd all value your answers to, so I'll present the poll question now. And the question is, what is the intended business outcome of your IoT application? And the possible responses are improve operational efficiencies, improve an existing product or service, create a new product or service, gain business intelligence. So the question, what is the intended business outcome of your IoT application? And the possible responses are improve operational efficiencies, improve an, an existing product or service, create a new product or service, or gain business intelligence. And just while we're waiting for the responses to get collated, um, I would point out that this is a um, interactive session. So after the presentations, um, I'll be opening the floor to questions and answers. So do enter your question into the panel on your screen, and I'll put that uh, to our speakers after the presentations. Um, now let's see what the findings of the poll were. That's quite interesting. Um, there's two key drivers here, obviously, creating new products or services uh, has the majority of responses, and improving operational efficiencies is the next most important, which I guess would uh, be as we would expect um, at this, this stage of IoT. Um, I'll, um, I'll hand over to Robin now. Uh, Robin, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Uh, just a, a quick comment about that uh, poll. Um, Create a new product or service, uh, uh, we believe, is the uh, primary driver in uh, IoT solutions at the moment. And then uh, improving operational efficiencies has uh, been the traditional um, high flyer, but that's sort of falling back a little bit. Uh, one that uh, we didn't really cover is compliance with regulatory requirements. Uh, so we got no responses uh, on that one. But uh, in fact, there are, there are issues where uh, IoT solutions uh, really are used for that purpose as well, but uh, perhaps not with, uh, with this audience. We can then move on to um, my slides. Um, and uh, trying to get to uh, a slide that is, uh, is working. Right. No, that's gone. So, um, what I thought would be a useful way to start this is uh, looking at IoT solutions and uh, build versus buy, is looking at some of the key trends in the uh, IoT marketplace. And uh, uh, because it gives a sort of uh, scoping of, uh, of, 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 the, of the issue uh, for, uh, for the build versus buy. So uh, the first point is uh, tremendous growth we're seeing in the marketplace at the moment. We're expecting an uh, endpoint, uh, the, edge, the edge devices, Endpoint growth uh, times 20 uh, in the period 2016 to 2022. Many more endpoints we're anticipating, so many more things are going to be connected, uh, and that that affects uh, lots of enterprises and how they connect things and what they connect. So, um, in addition to that, more data per endpoint, uh, and that's because point three. It's being driven by the need for more richer data for uh, operation optimization as well as uh, greater emphasis on uh, new services revenue. And of course, the poll question uh, really showed the importance of uh, new service revenues as, as part of that. Also, we're seeing uh, solutions moving from uh, local to global. Um, you know, traditionally, in the end-to-end uh, -end sort of world, most of the applications tended to be local. But now that it's becoming uh, much more of a central activity for uh, uh, an enterprise, uh, there is more um, involvement, more, more need for uh, global coverage. Um, and it's more normal now to connect uh, all assets and devices wherever they are, rather than just a few by exception. 
So it's more important to have everything connected or it's going to be over the next few years more important to have all the assets and devices connected wherever they are rather than just picking on a few because that way you can get a complete story. Um, so it's not, it's not then just a question of uh, justifying the cost of each individual new uh, connected device. It's looking at the overall solution and the overall uh, data that's coming from that and what value can be derived from that. And that's going to be perceived uh, in future to be much more important than, uh, than just uh, the cost of connecting an additional unit. So then there's the need for uh, multiple forms of uh, connectivity technology in one solution. Um, cellular has traditionally been the major um, area, but uh, then there is uh, also a need for, if you're going to connect everything everywhere, then uh, you need to have all forms of uh, connectivity available for, uh, for any particular solution. And then um, moving on to point eight, uh, end to end IoT solutions are moving from uh, tactical nice to have to a strategic necessity. Now this is uh, in, in really um, goes along with, uh, for example, moving into um, service revenue, new service revenue. If, uh, if a business is relying more on uh, service revenue to be created uh, from uh, uh, connectivity and uh, connected devices, then it becomes much more of a, a strategic necessity for the company to uh, to have that rather than just a tactical nice to have so that's that's one reason for moving to that but uh, but also uh, the the need for service and so forth uh, is also becoming much more important and at the same time uh, it means that IOT solutions are becoming uh, more mission critical uh, even for service support and that means that uh, high availability uh, is becoming essential. So uh, a high availability on a network, uh, it's much more important that the uh, network connection does not go down um, and it's uh, uh, becoming uh, something that uh, uh, moving forward, if you don't have, then you start to miss essential uh, information at important times. Then there is uh, point 11, uh, increasing the need for interoperability with uh, other solutions. So we're moving away from uh, what we used to call silo-based operations that didn't really connect with anything other than just uh, one set of outputs um, to uh, a situation where there is a need to share data between uh, different types of uh, applications. So interoperability becomes uh, increasingly uh, important. And um, Sorry, this moved before I was actually ready for it. Uh, so just going back, um, there's not just um, uh, about uh, connectivity. Uh, a complete uh, solution uh, with data visualization uh, is also required. And also that must be in uh, real time. And at the same time for all of that, there is a need for end-to-end uh, -end security at, uh, at all levels. So what does that mean for uh, planning IoT solutions and the uh, build versus buy type of um, question? Um, buying what fits today uh, is not just the whole story. You need to look at uh, what, to, what to buy, what to build that will fit tomorrow. Uh, uh, changing a system later is costly uh, and disruptive and uh, need to be clear about uh, growth prospects. Uh, so for example, Things like scalability of connectivity, uh, processing, resources, budget, all need to be considered. And these are issues that are going to be picked up in the uh, next part of the presentation from our core speakers. So the key question then is uh, build or buy uh, as part of that. And I'm going to now hand over to uh, Jilly Coston at uh, CORE, who's going to take us further into this presentation. Hi everybody, thank you very much for joining. Thanks Robin. Um, thanks very much indeed. So um, a little bit about CORE, actually a number of pe people have been interested to know the background of CORE and um, as you will see just appearing on your slides now, some of the highlights um, that you can you can hear and, and as you look at, as we think about the, the growth of CORE, um, we started off in 2003, uh, really quite a small acorn, and um, we've grown significantly um, from 2003 right up to date. A lot of the growth coming in the first 10 years, um, 
what we've now grown to is nearly 400 staff and 6,000 customers um, with 8.5 million endpoints uh, fully connected. Um, but we've gone beyond connectivity uh, into uh, more of the solution software sales and beyond connect managed connectivity into horizontal software services such as positioning and alerting and management of remote assets and devices. And what we've really been able to do is do that, as Robin talked about earlier, the need for more global coverage has been important. So we've grown out into multiple regions, starting of course in the US, um, moving uh, through acquisition growth into um, Latin America, obviously Canada as well, and uh, Australia, and now Europe with multiple acquisitions. So as you can see, we've, we've grown from a, a small acorn into a bit of an oak tree, um, more growth to go. Um, but as we look at some of the other important things um, that Robin also talked about in his earlier slide, really having a highly available network has been one of the most critical factors for all of our customers. We work with customers who both build and buy IoT services, and that's um, given them a vast and a wide range of experience. But that really needs to run over a geo-redundant, co-located global, glo global and local network that's secure and, and that's very private. So we have, uh, as you'll be able to see on the screen now, um, 12 office locations across eight countries. Um, servicing customers in 110 locations and across eight global data centers and giving that highly available network. So I think that's probably enough about core and um, thank you very much for giving us your attention on, on, on that just really to give you some context and the background of core. And um, as we move into the, the real um, detail of to build or to buy, I'm interested really to introduce you to Peter van der Houten, who is going to talk to us now about the IoT DNA. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, Julie. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Julie said, the, um, the, the starting point of, uh, of our presentation to you is around uh, what we term DNA. Now, when we talk about the key components of an IoT solution, we refer to its DNA, which stands for the device, the network, and the application. Uh, the devices are effectively the things in the Internet of Things, and, and simply put, a device is the hardware that gathers, transmits, and in some cases even analyzes and processes the data. Uh, the device could be a router, a gateway, uh, or perhaps a remote sensor attached to a water tank or something of that sort. Moving on to the network, this is the component that effectively links everything together. Think of it as the, the, the plumbing for your solution. The network actually consists of the hardware and the software involved in transmitting data from, from point A to point B. And depending on the use case and the application, this could be cellular connectivity, it could be Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or, or even satellite connectivity. Finally, we have the application. Uh, think of the application as the brains of the operation. So the application is the, the business intelligence engine that, uh, that brings your IoT solution to life and applies the, the logic and actions to the data that, that it receives. Uh, this is all with the purpose of providing value to, to your end user. And, and don't forget that the application is effectively your, your end user's view of your IoT solution. So needless to say, it deserves a, a lot of your focus. Now, the question of whether to build or buy really stretches across all three of these components. Uh, and in the slides that follow, we will focus specifically on the device component of the DNA story when considering uh, a build versus buy approach. So we have two options when it comes to, uh, to our device. Uh, we can either build it or we can buy it. Um, there is actually a third option, which is is really a hybrid of the two and involves partnering with a build specialist. But for the purpose of this discussion, we'll we'll focus on building or buying. So first, let's uh, first up, let's let's take a look at what building your own device would actually entail. Building means starting from scratch uh, with nothing more than a concept, a dream, and, and hopefully a big pot of money as well. Uh, it brings with it pros and cons, and undoubtedly more work, but also more control over the process and and the end product. Now, most, if not all, of the build activities are, uh, will, will, will be 
performed in-house, including the overall design, the engineering, and the manufacturing of your device. Uh, and if we use the analogy of building, building our own house, uh, this means you'll need to architect your own house plans, plan up the construction work, mix the cement, and, and lay the bricks yourself. But even before we get to that point, uh, you need to think about where you're actually going to source the bricks and mortar from, as well as the other building materials that you need to do the job. So if we relate that back to building your own device, those materials might include a cellular modem, printed circuit boards or, or PCBs, processors, antennas, embedded SIMs, and, and even advanced production line equipment. So going back to our house, if, we, if we're to wrap up the construction of our house so that we can actually move in, the building needs to be safety checked and deemed hab habitable before we can actually uh, make the move. Likewise, when you, when you complete the build of your own device, uh, whilst the hard work is done, the device needs to be tested, certified for use, and you need to ensure it is supportable once it is in the hands of the end user. Okay, so if we um, if we take a look at the second option, which is to buy, um, the landscape has changed somewhat in, the, in recent years when it comes to buying ready-made M2M or, or IoT devices. And quite simply, because general purpose or, or even industry-specific devices have not been available to purchase um, as, um, as off-the-shelf solutions in years gone by, um, but we are now seeing a, a, a big change, um, and, and there are more and more of those ready-made devices that are becoming available to us and, and to our customers. Um, now, in, in many cases, this is helping businesses speed up their time to market and, and, uh, and accelerate their journey towards making revenue from their, uh, their, their new products and services. As with the option to build, buying comes with a number of pros and cons, obviously. Uh, and in terms of the activities, well, the, the device, uh, the design rather, the, the engineering, the component sourcing, the manufacturing, the testing, and the after sale support are for the most part out of your hands. Whilst this means that you ultimately have very little hands-on control of how your device is constructed and what it eventually looks like and how it will be supported, it also means that you can leave those activities to those that specialize in those areas, allowing you to, to really keep your your focus on your overall business objective, uh, which is getting to market as quickly as possible, maximizing your revenue and, uh, and accelerating your return on investment. I'll now hand back to Julie. Thanks, Peter. Um, so Peter, one of the things that we, we, um, that we learned uh, over the years is um, how much um, the number of devices has changed in terms of deployment. Robin talked about it when he talked about connecting all assets now rather than a few by exception, which we might have seen in the earlier days of M2M and IoT. So when we think about scale, how many devices will you need to connect? Actually, I think we're going to see that grow um, if, if Robin's um, analogy is, is the correct one. So the answer to this question does really significantly impact the decision. Um, and as you think about um, it, as you think about that 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 decision moving forward, then what, Peter, from your perspective, are the key factors and considerations that customers need to think about when they're thinking about building or buying the solution themselves? So, so you're, you're right in terms of scale is is very much kind of the first question that we have to answer. But the, the, there are the, there are two sides to the build or buy debate, and um, both carry important benefits and, and and notable drawbacks. But ultimately, the 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 aim that we have to keep in mind is which option will will give our M two M or our IoT solution the best chance of success. And as you rightly say, it's you know the, the question of scale is is, is top of the list uh, in, in that regard. Now. Um, whilst this isn't always the case, um, let me just move forward a couple of paces. Uh, whilst it's not always the case, usually the, the optimum starting point is, is anywhere between 2,000 and 5,000 devices. Typically, any, any number below that point results in building costs that are far too excessive to, to really deliver the required economy of scale. Having said that, uh, there are exceptions to the rule, and, and depending on your industry and your circumstances, there could be an argument to either build or buy based on, on asset value, as an example. So if we consider an energy company that has uh, 100 wind turbines, whilst it might not seem practical for them to, to build their own device just to connect 100 of those wind turbines, if we factor in that each one of those wind turbines could potentially be worth upwards of a million euros or, or, or a million dollars, building a device might make a lot of sense in that scenario. 
And conversely, if we consider, say, a, a lottery company that may have thousands of uh, lottery ticketing machines located in various stores across the country, fixed connectivity and landlines are, are not part of their core business. And simply put, they need a way of connecting those, those ticketing machines back to base in order to process the, the customer ticket purchases. So in this scenario, buying a, a ready-made device that can easily be fitted to their lottery machines probably makes the most sense for them. So if we look at some of the other factors, um, the, a, a running theme across um, the, the, the build or buy argument is, um, is, is money and cost. So if we look at the upfront expenditure, um, this, this is a critical decision when it comes to whether we, we build or buy. In terms of the initial cost, um, this is the upfront cost for us to get our device out into the marketplace. Now, as technology evolves, component hardware becomes cheaper and cheaper. And if we take a cellular module, for example, uh, let's say on the safe side, that could cost you up to $100, but typically you can pick one up for anywhere between $20 and $40. Now, obviously, this depends on the, uh, the technology you require and whether it needs to be 2G, 3G, or 4G, um, or, or, or perhaps a low-power technology as well. If we compare and contrast that with, with buying a ready-made device, which, again, depending on the technology you, you, you require, could set you back anywhere from $200 to $600 for a, um, a relatively low to, to mid-range device, that might seem like a substantial difference. But actually, once you factor in the, the other non-hardware-related costs, such as the design and engineering time, as well as the manufacturing and certification costs, that gap certainly gets a lot smaller. So let's take a look at those topics in the next few slides. So if we look at personnel or human resources, um, if you're thinking about building your own device, you should also be prepared to scale up in terms of your in-house teams and resources. Building a device requires a lot of financial resource, not least in terms of employing suitably skilled people to actually put the, the, the pieces of the puzzle together. So if we look back at the build activities we mentioned in the previous section, we had the following. We had, we had design and engineering. We had component sourcing, we had manufacturing, we had testing and certification, and we, we had after sale support. If we continue with the analogy of building our own house, before the first brick is laid, you need to ensure you have a competent architect available to you, or in this case, uh, a design resource who's, who's proficient in the design of wireless devices. Following that, you need to consider where you're going to actually buy your bricks and mortar from. For that, you'll need a procurement function capable of negotiating agreements with the suppliers you want to work with and at the price point that you need to keep with. So now that we have our architect in place and he's designed or he or she has designed our beautiful house and we bought our bricks and cement, and we have all our construction uh, machinery available to us, we have to actually set about constructing the house. And in terms of building a, a new device, you'll need to ensure you have a smooth running production line in, in, in place to piece together your device in the most efficient manner possible. So if we fast forward to the end of that production line where we find our, our final hurdle, before we can move into our, uh, our shiny new house, building regulation checks and safety checks, as I mentioned before, need to be carried out uh, to ensure it's fit for purpose and, and conforms with industry standards. This is really no different when building your, your own device. There are various industry and regulatory, not to mention operator certifications in the, in the cellular world that your device will be subject to before it can be released into the wild. But if we compare that whole process with buying a device, buying is a much simpler journey. With the exception of procurement staff, uh, typically no additional personnel are going to be required as all of the, the build activities that we've spoken about uh, are effectively outsourced to an external party. Um, the cost for all of those activities are rolled up in the final price that you pay uh, the vendor or manufacturer for your, for your finished product. Next, we'll take a look at uh, speed to market. So if the question of scale is first on the list, then the question of how quickly do you need to get your solution to market shouldn't be too far behind that. We're all familiar with the adage of uh, you know, time is money, and that certainly applies to this situation. The IoT landscape is, is extremely competitive, as we all know, and we have seen a number of solution providers rush to market only to be pipped to the post by a, a competitor's product. So if we consider how that relates to the debate around whether to build or buy our device, the facts are pretty simple. Building your own device will almost certainly be a more time-consuming process. It can take months, if not years, just to certify your device, never mind the, the hard graft and the hours of burning the midnight oil that it will take 
for you to get your device into a semi-ready state where it can actually go through the certification testing. Now, that, that isn't to say it isn't a worthwhile exercise. In some cases, it will be. But the maturity of your market and how quickly you need to participate and perhaps lead in that market space is a, is a very important assessment. Finally, uh, we'll look at the overall picture of what your IoT solution and product ultimately means in terms of your company and your brand reputation. There is the consideration of how you position or, or how you wish to position your company and your brand in the market when it comes to the decision of whether to build or buy. For example, is it important for your brand that you're seen as a, an innovator in your particular industry? Now, depending on the maturity of the industry, as I mentioned before, that, you, that, that you're part of, and in, in particular whether there are any competing products and services in the market already, building your own device might make a lot of sense, and in some cases it might actually be your only option. For a start, having the complete ownership of the device and the associated infrastructure may actually give you a competitive edge. If you own the intellectual property rights for your device and you can protect your innovation and also safeguard against copycat solutions, that's not necessarily a bad place to be. This is most often not the case, though, when it comes to buying in, as you're effectively at the mercy of whoever it is that you're going to be purchasing your, your device or your hardware from. And um, you effectively have no real IPR of, of your own to control. You should, um, you should also consider the, the longer term strategy of your, um, of your business and of your products and services and whether future proofing your solution is something that you need to consider at this point. As Robin mentioned uh, at the start of the presentation, in fact, retrofitting and upgrading your solution um, uh, and making enhancements further on down the line is, is a very costly exercise and one that may really impact your bottom line. So in the next section, we'll, um, we'll take a look at the best practices for deployment. So to start off with that, we'll look at when building your device might make sense. So now that we've considered the, the various factors involved, where, uh, involved with um, uh, making a decision around whether you, you, you build uh, your own device or whether you buy it in, um, we'll look at some practical examples of when actually building your own device might make more sense than buying it. So typically, the types of customers that, that will reach this conclusion are those that are taking something fairly unique to the market. Often when there is uh, no precedence of uh, such a product or a service having been launched into the marketplace before. A, a great example of that from the, uh, the list on the right is the, the, the smart uh, street lighting. So smart street lighting is, is a relatively new concept and, and one that brings with it a completely new service and revenue model. Uh, up to now, the, uh, the street light has been used for, for, for fairly simple purposes, uh, and that's lighting up our roads and motorways for the, for the purpose of the safety of the, uh, the users of those roads. The most advanced thing we've really been able to achieve with, uh, with, with the current iteration of our, our street lights is, is turning the uh, street lights uh, on and off in certain areas, uh, depending on the time of day. So as an example, that might be between midnight and 5 a.m. in the morning, to save on energy because there are no users on a particular road, the municipality might uh, opt to, to turn those lights on. But that's probably the extent of the, um, uh, of, of, of the smart that goes with it. But that's really changing. Uh, so in, in fact, lighting up the roads is, is pretty much the most basic function uh, a smart street light will perform going forwards. These street lights are becoming hubs of smart technology to deliver not only energy savings to, to municipalities and, and councils, but, but also open up uh, new untapped revenue streams as well. These lights are remotely controllable and programmable. Um, they're capable of delivering public service announcements to, to road users, um, accent lighting to, to, for example, flag flag down an accident for the attention of emergency services, and even extending into consumer advertising as well, where you can see there's, uh, the, there's sort of additional money to be made in that area. All of this is something that in, in the form of a street light has never really existed before. It's effectively a new industry, and that comes with uh, immaturity of the hardware and the software platforms required to deliver the services that I've just mentioned. Now, in this situation, building your own device really does make a lot of sense. Not only does it protect your innovation, as we discussed earlier, but it also allows you to secure new and evolving revenue streams going forward. Uh, this isn't simply limited to the device. Um, the back-end platforms, whilst we are talking about the device, the, the back-end platforms and the software services and even the front-end user applications associated with these sort of solutions are being built from the ground up, uh, all of which results uh, in, in a proprietary app, uh, app uh, a proprietary service. 
So if we look at now when uh, buying would make sense, when we look at the overall picture of buying your um, uh, buying a device for your IoT solution, there, there's, there's an argument to say that this is a, a more clear-cut decision. Usually buying makes a lot more sense when we consider market maturity, and, and a great example of that is, is perhaps the financial sector. Whether it be on, on point-of-sale devices or, or, or solutions or ATMs, the industry has multiple well-established players operating in this space, all of whom have, have built the device and in many cases the application and the back-end infrastructure from the ground up already. It makes little sense uh, to spend a lot of time, money and resource entering that race yourself. But that, that isn't really the only driver behind opting to buy rather than build. It, it's important to consider your overall business model and what your competencies are. Setting up a, a well-oiled production line to, to build your own device uh, will, will, will have a significant impact on how your business operates. It's, it's a real change in focus. If you're set up and positioned, uh, uh, for example, as a service provider, then shifting your, your operations to the production of hardware is a, is, a, is a huge change of focus. That isn't to say it isn't the right move, uh, depending on the overall strategy of your business, but it would it would almost certainly make more sense to uh, to, to to really keep your focus on your your your, your service based model and buy an off the shelf uh, uh, device that, that that is capable of enhancing those services. Now I I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, there is in fact a, a third option available to you. Um, that option is to, to partner with uh, a hardware build specialist who can really give you the flexibility and the control associated with building your own device, but also takes care of the, um, the design, the, the, the build and the test phase activities on your behalf. So in effect, you, you keep control over the shape, the feel and the, the function of your device, but the heavy lifting is outsourced to a partner who, is, is, um, who has already made operation for building, testing and launching devices into the marketplace. So with all that said, um, I'll, I'll now hand back to Jilly uh, to discuss the part of, of uh, bundling services has to play in all of this. Over to you, Jilly. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, so um, as Peter said, you know, bu bundling is really key whether you're building or you're buying. And um, the, the differences here really are, are you know, you, you want to partner with a company that can help you in the overall process. And Peter's talked about many of those things there. They relate to the scale, the, the initial setup costs, the types of people and the transformation that you require in your business um, for building, um, and, and the speed to market. Also, your, your IP and, and your brand. And those things, really, when you're building, um, you're avoiding the common pitfalls if you're focusing on those types of things when you're introducing a new product or whether you're driving operational efficiency or both. What you really tend to get with, with building um, is that supply chain simplification. So you're going to drive that operational efficiency and um, you allow the, the business to grow with it and retain some of that IP. When you're buying, all of the same things apply. Um, Bundling again is, is particularly key and, and, and all of the services. The main difference here is that the solution is pre-integrated so that you're already, you're already driving your ability to increase your speed to market and um, perhaps at some of the expense of things like IP and um, the, the other elements of, of brand and um, initial costs are also impacted. But that, that's really where the leverage is, the difference between building or buying are in these different different points, whether you want to have stronger IP or whether you want to be faster to market, whether you want to have a lower setup cost by integrating everything up front, or whether you've got a big budget and you're quite happy to take the different components at each stage. Um, I think um, from an overall point of view, um, also thinking about where you're going to deploy uh, global coverage and the types of technology that you use are going to be really key here. So being able to pilot something, so think big, start small, and scale fast. And we hope that um, some of these elements that, that, that Peter and Robin um, have taken you through today will help you, whether you're building a new product on service or you're driving more efficiency for your business. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Chili. That was really interesting, and, and also thanks to Peter and Robin. Um, we've already had some questions come in from the audience, but um, we've got quite a large amount of time and open for questions, so do um, feel free to keep adding your questions, and I'll put them to the panel. Um, let's move on to um, the first question that I've selected. Um, the question is, um, what types of applications can off-the-shelf devices support? Um, and, and I guess the question probably comes from the perspective that um, – whether off-the-shelf devices can support highly specific applications that have um, individual needs effectively. So I'd like to put that question uh, to the panel. Um, so I'll phrase that, uh, I'll repeat that question. What types of applications can off-the-shelf devices support? And uh, maybe we should start with, uh, with, with Peter for that question. Sure, so uh, what, what we are seeing is, is definitely a trend in um, off-the-shelf devices in, in terms of the price points coming down, but also in terms of the capabilities being generalized and opened up, uh, opened up a bit more. So um, you can pick up uh, an off-the-shelf device for, let's say, around $200, and whilst that, that device will serve as a uh, router or a gateway to the outside world, it will also have um, an interface for sensors. So if you imagine the number of applications that that opens you up to, if we think of just sort of you know, uh, monitoring water uh, levels or, or oil tankers or whatever it might be, those devices can, uh, with, the, with the right sensors, um, can effectively feed that information back to base. So we're seeing, as I say, a, um, a, a, a drop in terms of the, the general price point, but also the capabilities are being opened up. Now, that's not necessarily to say it, it, it's a one-size-fits-all approach. There will be instances where you do need a device that is, is, is more custom built or, or specific to the industry or application that you're using. But we're definitely seeing uh, that marketplace open up a bit more. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, Julie, do you have anything to add on, on that, um, that thought about off-the-shelf um, devices? Yeah, and, and I think the question was also related to what types of applications. So to just add to Peter's point there, um, places where we see quite a lot of horizontal um, capabilities um, are in the sort of routers and gateways. So um, where you can you, where you can deploy them in, in multiple um, scenarios. A, a good example uh, going with Peter's house building theme would be construction. Um, perhaps um, a router is installed um, with a 4G capability. Um, so that construction workers have um, access to information, um, uh, internet, um, email, that type of thing when they're on site. Um, and, you know, that's typically a sort of six to eight week time scale to get a fixed line in. So it can be a temporary thing. But then also we see customers retaining those services afterwards as a backup. So whilst they've had um, the cost of putting the router in to begin with, the types of applications that it's been used for, and instead of being an immediate service availability um, proposition for them, it then becomes a backup and recovery proposition where it's the secondary uh, type of communication. If things go down on the site later, um, then uh, it can be utilised for longer periods of time. We see more and more applications like that. Same thing in retail. You know, you might you might use a, a router or a device for um, footfall monitoring, um, but then you can add a refrigeration on there. Uh, perhaps we see less um, sort of um, horizontal type services or multiple use of routers where it's things like um, security, fire panel, and alarm systems. They still tend to require a dedicated um, fixed. Uh, communication, but in other places where it's not so mission critical, then you can layer on uh, multiple services using the same technology, and therefore it's just using a little bit extra bandwidth, and um, that you can that you can just add on rather than putting in a whole new solution. So hopefully that gives some um, some ideas of application. Yeah, sure. I mean, is it is it that we're seeing a sort of two stage situation develop where there are these kind of horizontal applications like monitoring liquid flows or water levels or deciding whether to turn something on or off, given that uh, you know you might have a sensor that that um, tells whether it's dark or light or something that simple, but there's there's this kind of commonality between fairly basic applications that have certain performance needs from a device, and in those cases 
would those be more off the shelf than you know, perhaps more um, in-depth needs in, in healthcare or some other industry? Um, so, so do you think there's, there's perhaps kind of two distinct market areas developing where there's um, – uh, a kind of horizontal approach, which can be off-the-shelf devices, because the functionality is there; it's trialled and it already exists. So, you know, all the good time to market can be achieved. Um, but for perhaps more specific uh, applications, there's a need to um, go into the development process more. Do you think that's a fair statement to say? Yeah, I think that's a great summary. Um, I would also not just link it to devices. I know we've talked a lot about devices, but I'd also think about it in terms of platforms as well. There's a lot of capabilities within the, within the platform. So um, you've got sort of uh, the, the approach of the rules and alerts that you can create in a platform um, and within the device. Um, now we're really seeing multiple different verticals being able to use a common set of features, maybe with some odd uh, pieces of tailoring. But in general, um, you know, when we look at um, our software platforms, for example, that are looking at the position, they're also looking at what the device is doing. So it's linked to the device, but the platform is the thing that's really driving the, the, um, the information or the valuable information as to what you then do with it. So I think it moves from just um, moving from the device also into the, the software platform and the rule system that you put around that and what you're going to use it for. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move on a bit. Um, I've got another question here, um, which I, I'd like to put to Robin, actually, which, um, which is, um, what do you see as the biggest risks of building or designing an, an IoT device um, from scratch? Uh, Robin, um, what, what, what risks do you see with the um, DIY approach? Well, it's, uh, it's really the cost versus the returns and uh, how quickly uh, that can be created and, uh, and put into service. Um, I think uh, uh, building uh, anything from scratch, uh, it depends on the uh, expertise of the uh, staff that are doing it, of course, but uh, um, generally um, it can be uh, an expensive and risky process. Um, so I think uh, it's, uh, it needs to be uh, a well-understood well-resourced um, uh, type of activity um, uh, that's done it before, because um, uh, uh, approaching these things from uh, from scratch uh, without having uh, a lot of experience is uh, is a is a is a risky process, as I say. Um, uh, Thanks, Robin. Um, I, I guess that leads us probably to the the kind of third way that Peter was, uh, was alluding to, that um, you can actually tap into the expertise of, of device people to get specific functionality put into a, a device. So you get this kind of hybrid um, off-the-shelf device that has some of the, the, the kind of more, more uh, standard capabilities, and you can partner with a specialist who knows how to design function-specific devices to help you get to that highly specific device that you want. Um, do you see that sort of hybrid approach um, take, uh, gathering traction as, as, the, uh, as the applications become more complex that, uh, that we see being deployed across IoT? Sorry, is that to me? Uh, it can be, Robin, <laughs> if, right, if, yeah. if you think that would well, be... Well, yes, uh, uh, certainly. It's probably one, uh, probably one for Peter as well because he was talking about the, uh, uh, that particular aspect. But... Uh, Yes, uh, sort of using um, uh, expert teams uh, within the uh, overall build um, uh, activity, um, then uh, yes, it makes, uh, it makes a lot of sense to do that. But maybe Peter can uh, expand on that. Yeah, just to, just just to add my side. I think I think if we if we actually look beyond, I know this this webinar is to discuss the uh, build versus buy approach in in terms of the device. But as Julie said, you know if we if we look beyond the the device um, uh, to the application and the network piece, it's um it, it's uncommon that anyone would uh, really piece together an end to end solution nowadays. I would say without um, getting help from an outside organization or outsourcing some piece of that puzzle to someone else. So you know the application space. Uh, just to just just to mention one example is is a, is a, uh, a great example of where 
you see a lot of companies that or, or, or businesses that might have developed their own device and their own firmware, but actually, you know, at the end of the day, they they, they have standard communication protocols that they use within those devices uh, to speak to a backend application service. And we're seeing a lot of application providers uh, generalize their services and provide, you know, horizontal platforms that, uh, you know, these sort of companies can can tap into. So. You know, their, their comp the core competency might be developing the device, but actually in the application space, um, an approach to, to, to work with a provider that provides them with a, a hybrid approach, if we're talking about the application, might make perfect sense for them. You know, they have this, this, this horizontal application platform and they can, they can tweak it and they can shape it according to, to what their specific application and their, 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 their product or service needs to, needs to do in the marketplace. Thank you, Peter. Um, let's move on. Um, another question that's uh, that's come in is: Is there any way to mitigate the upfront cost associated with purchasing an off-the-shelf device? Um, I mean, I guess that's a, a question that's really open to the the business models and, and how individual vendors approach the market in terms of, of off-the-shelf devices. But, um, um, Jilly, do you do you have any views on on how to mitigate upfront costs? Yeah, I was just having a think about that there, how best to answer that. Um I think it depends on it depends on the application, but um there are probably quite a few examples of where, you know, creating a, a very low upfront cost and an ongoing cost bundling it with connectivity um and um the hardware um device itself and a really established model of that is actually in fleet management that, that's something that's been happening for really the last 10 years so that's a really good example of where um quite a number of companies bundle those things together and and therefore you're paying a monthly fee um or an annual fee uh but i i think it depends on vendors certainly from core's perspective we 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 are flexible in a number of different uh, options um, but probably the most favoured for most companies still at the moment is you know, the, the hardware up front with the connectivity, perhaps with the SIM um, amortised over the length of the contract. Do you think that might change as the volumes in, um, uh, the volumes increase? Because you know, when, when we get into you know, tens of thousands of devices and, and hundreds of thousands of devices in deployments, I, I could see that, that being a, a significant upfront capital cost to, to buy the devices and I, I could see many business cases for, for IoT apps relying on basically servitizing the, the device and, and bundling it with the connectivity and, and other fees just to to basically move the capex into into an opex uh, into an ongoing opex model just to handle the scale do you, do you think scale is going to, to have that sort of impact on on how people buy devices? Yeah, from a commercial point of view, I think that um, there's, there's uh, a definite need, as, as you're suggesting there, and that's a great opportunity for many, many companies. And um, if you look at the um, UK government SMIP, the, the Smart Metering Implementation Programme, you know that's a, a great opportunity for established players. And um, you know, if you look at meters today, you know they're pretty much leased to utilities through Macquarie, and um, there's you know, so there's, there's established players, but there's also new players and new opportunities. Um, whether it's this, you know the, the leasing models that exist or or or, or a kind of own book. Um, but at the moment, I think it's much more dependent on business case and individual yeah. situations. Um, at, at, for right now, but what a great opportunity for the future. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Robin, um, do, do you see that? Um, do you see the the emergence of massive IoT um, affecting current attitudes to um, to how uh, devices are, are, are bought? Uh, very likely, um, because uh, if we see a substantial growth in um, uh, usage and endpoints, then that 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 implies a significant. Um, upfront investment potentially in, uh, in in lots of devices so um, moving more towards uh, a service type of uh, approach might well be uh, appropriate um, I mean as far the, as far as the um, uh, supplying company is concerned it might be more just like a financial uh, arrangement but Ginny uh, uh, mentioned um, use of platforms uh, earlier on and of course we're seeing Many platforms in the marketplace at the moment, uh, well over 400 
um, and uh, that's increasing all the time. So uh, you could say that there is a, there's a lot of stuff out there to uh, to connect with, uh, and there's a, a lot of stuff uh, out there to connect uh, as well. Um, and we're going to see um, tremendous growth in uh, both of those uh, areas. Uh, to pay for all of that up front uh, is asking a lot. So I think uh, there needs to be some way of, uh, of uh, sharing that cost or spreading it out uh, over the length of a project, um, uh, so over several years rather than uh, totally up front. So I think that inevitably, uh, if we're going to see and want the sort of growth that uh, we anticipate in the IoT market, then I think that we're going to have to find um, a financial way of uh, overcoming those issues as well. Thanks, Robin. Um, I have another question that's come in. I'm just trying to um, work out how best to direct this. I think, Peter, it might be one for you. The question is, can you clarify um, what you meant when you described a complete IoT solution with data visualizations? And what does this imply for compatibility and, and certification? Um, I, I think it's probably just a question to try and clarify that for, for the uh, audience member who's asked that question, uh, Peter. But um, could, could you perhaps expand on um, where the complete uh, IoT solution um, is, is, an, is important terminology here, I guess, because I think it's the completeness that uh, is, is perhaps where the, the lack of clarity has come in for the questioner. Sure. So I, I think that that might have been a, a point in uh, in Robin's presentation, but I'll, I'll give my point of view and then, then hand <laughs> to, to to Robin. No, that's okay. No problem. Uh, so when when we look at a complete IoT solution, we look at the the story of having the device and the network and the application. A complete IoT uh, IoT solution in terms of an off the shelf solution is one that is is pretty much ready made and, and fit for purpose from from the off. There's no there's no major development required on any of those aspects, whether it's the device, the network, or the application. So it might be that if we look at um, uh, if we look at that from a compatibility point of view and, and from a certification point of view, you have solution providers that are working. Uh, uh, more often than not, together in the background to deliver a common solution to to, to the market, and uh, whilst ensuring that obviously all the components of that that, that solution are, are obviously interoperable and that they're, they're compatible and everything works as it should. And as far as the end user is concerned, whoever that is, whether that's a business or an actual end consumer, whoever that end user is, they 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 they, they, they get one single sort of focal point for their for, for their product and service. Now, where the certification piece comes into that, and that is a, um, it's, it's, a it's a big piece and it's, it's more important in, in certain regions of the world uh, versus others. But when we look at actually how long it takes to, once we've, once we've done the hard work of building our device, how long it takes us to jump through the, the various hoops that we have to jump through to make sure that it meets, meets all the, the industry and the regulatory uh, conditions around that. And as I mentioned earlier, that could include uh, you know, mobile operator-based certifications as well. It, it can be quite a tedious process. So if you picture a, a business or an organization that has pretty much the, the application, the network side of things sorted, and they just need to shoehorn a device into their, uh, their, their solution, um, outsourcing that piece makes a hell of a lot of sense for them because it means that from a, uh, simply from a, a time to market point of view, they, they, they're, they're already kind of um, uh, ahead of where they, uh, they, they you know, the, they would be if they were just sort of starting that journey and, and scoping out their own device to build. So that's that's really my view of it. Um, I think uh, that there's a lot of benefit when it comes to some uh, collaboration that goes on with uh, amongst different partners in this industry, um, helping one another really to, to to overcome some of these obstacles when it comes to compatibility and and, and getting devices certified. So that we 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 see more and more uh, complete IoT solutions as well. Perhaps I could pick up that point as well, because uh, as, as Peter says, it was probably uh, related to my comment. Uh, so what I was saying was uh, that uh, looking at IoT solutions is not just about connectivity. It's about the complete solution, including the uh, data visualization. And what I meant by that was the uh, uh, data visualization is basically making sense of the data. So uh, it's, it's not just uh, looking at... Uh, how to do the uh, IoT application in the, in the form of connectivity and the, uh, the hardware and the stuff that, 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 that relates to that. But it's also uh, what you make of the data and uh, what, what value do you get uh, from that. Um, 
And clearly there is a need for um, much more effort, much more work uh, in that area to, um, uh, to get uh, rapid uh, returns. Um, some of that is happening in real time, so uh, there's, a, there's a need for uh, graphical representations there rather than text, and it's, uh, it's not going to be summarized. It's uh, it not, not summarized in text form. It's got to be uh, uh, put into a form that can be uh, instantly uh, recognized. It could be dashboards and so forth. Uh, and also things by exception. So there is uh, there is a need for uh, quite a lot of work at the uh, higher levels, uh, which of course is going on now. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of work in uh, um, uh, processing and dealing with data in uh, in real time. So that's really what I was talking about. Okay, thanks, Robin. Um, I think we've got time for for one uh, one more question. Um, a question's come in, and it's asking really about the um, the communications method, and I think that's an interesting point because that does affect the the, the devices um, quite substantially. The question is, do we see the communications for the device using um, NB IoT, LoRa, Sigfox, or, or other alternatives? And, and how will the cost of these offerings affect what type of build we go with? Um, I think that's a really interesting area. Uh, Robin, what's, what's your view on the, net, the, the connection technology's effect on the device itself? Uh, well, you might be looking at it the wrong way around. It's, it's more a case of uh, if you've got a sensor out there that's doing a particular job, what forms of connectivity do you need to get that mm. data back? Uh, and uh, and then uh, what is the most uh, cost-effective uh, way of, of doing that? Uh, I think uh, the overall point, though, is, is that uh, there are, in the future, going to be uh, lots of different forms of connectivity. I made the point earlier on that uh, uh, it's going to be important to connect everything, uh, wherever it is, uh, to get as much data back as possible uh, and to get a complete solution. Um, and this is just a manifestation of that. We've got uh, lots of different types of uh, connectivity, lots of different forms of connectivity. Which is the most economical? Which is the mo makes the most sense for uh, any particular data source? Um, and I think that uh, it's, uh, we we've had this argument as to uh, which of these technologies is going to succeed and which ones aren't. Um, I think that uh, they all have a part to play in the marketplace, and they all have a part that they, they, all, they all need to find their place uh, in the marketplace. So uh, we've got the, the low data, the very low data type of uh, connectivity types, which are looking for and implementing um, applications that we've really not considered before uh, in, in the market because it's not been cost effective to, uh, to get down to that sort of level. So they're being very innovative in the uh, sort of applications that they're looking at, um, and uh, you know, that will have its own growth rate. Um, and then you look at uh, cellular. Cellular is uh, well established uh, in the marketplace, but we're now moving towards uh, the, uh, the lower data rate uh, or uh, lower power uh, wide area type of uh, um, uh, technologies like uh, MBIoT and, and, and CATM. And uh, those will also find their place. Um, we have, of course, the uh, traditional situation, which uh, Jilly mentioned earlier about um, uh, 2G sunset, things like that, um, mm -hmm. and we need to replace those. Uh, so there's uh, you know, technologies that uh, are required to do that, and that's probably more likely to be cellular-based technologies than the others. Uh, so I think that uh, there's a richness out there of uh, connectivity types that uh, we're going to see accelerate uh, over the next few years as we get more used to uh, the, the new types of data sources that we need to bring in to these uh, IoT solutions. Great. Thank you, Robin. Um, I think we're probably at the point now where we should wrap up today's proceedings. So um, I'd like to thank our panelists, Jilly Coston and uh, Peter van den Houten from CORE, and of course, Robin Duke Willey from Beach and Research. Uh, thanks all very much for participating today, and thanks also to the audience. Um, I'm George Malam, the Managing Editor of IoT Now. Thanks very much for joining us today. Goodbye. <laughs>